2 o'clock rock, and I have the honor and joy of being together with Senator Josh Green, District 3 on the Big Island. Welcome to the show, your show, Josh. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Thanks for taking it over. We're going we're gonna to call this uh, health, health in Hawaii. Yes rather than health care in Hawaii. We're going to broaden it up today yes. a little bit. We're going to look at the issues that came up and are likely to come up. So, but, you know, everybody says that Hawaii is, you know, longevity, you live longer, people are on, you know, demographically uh, healthier here. Is it true? It's true. Uh, overall, we're a healthier society. we less likely to shoot ourselves, gun ourselves down. We have drug addiction issues, but we're contained here. You usually can find some help uh, we you know we move at a slower pace in some ways so that i think there's a little less of the mayhem that we see on the mainland so yeah we're healthier it's a more wonderful place to be but we still have like really big problems and i think that one of the challenges we have is some problems which shouldn't be intractable have become intractable because of our approach to problem solving and that's a frustration, if nothing else. Yeah, which, uh, I'd like to go to that, really do. Just wondering, though, <clears throat> you know, when, when I grew up here, I, I grew up in my 20s here, you know, uh -huh. um, it was really open space. Yeah. There was a lot, of, a lot of people went out into the woods. They went hiking all the time. That was the recreation. And there was a lot of travel to the neighbor islands. Yes. Um, it was really romantic, actually, in those days. Uh -huh. But now we have Kaka'ako. And we have, you know, these tall tower kinds of buildings right. and uh, sometimes very thoughtless buildings with very little planning involved. And so if you thought that Hawaii was a healthy place, both mind and spirit and, and body, right. because of this open air thing we had, this beautiful environment, that environment is being, may I say, taken away from us. Does that affect the health of the population? Too? It does. Uh, we're going to urbanize here. We're urbanizing right now as we speak. I think we're creating two Hawaii's in some ways. We have the neighbor island Hawaii, and then we have the Honolulu Hawaii, or the Oahu Hawaii. Uh, and that's, that's a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, it both comes with a downside, for sure, that as we urbanize, we're going to see probably some of the crime that we see in mainland cities. We will see some of the pollution. We'll see some of the uh, psychological impacts of human congestion, noise, uh, and that's a sad thing, I think, because people can uh, wax philosophic, like you, you just did very nicely about what Hawaii used to be everywhere. Uh, the benefit is it also brings some other opportunities, uh, modern innovation, drawing other people from you know, the, the global metropolis uh, world. Uh, we'll get those people coming to Hawaii and living in Honolulu. So hopefully we'll get the best of both worlds, but I do as a neighbor island guy, neighbor island legislator and someone who lives in Kona, I feel that they're very different. I spend a bunch of days every week over here and there. So different. Yeah, the, the different sides of the world. And, I mean, it's nice to have both. For example, there's Internet in Kona. Yes. <laughs> that would be, it would be a little less attractive if it was all great country but no Internet. Right. You've got to have both. You do. Uh, but I'll tell you, when I'm on call in Javi, for instance, I don't have um, easy access to Internet or cell sometimes. Even though I'm in a hospital, I'm treating someone with a heart attack, and I want to communicate to a trauma surgeon, sometimes we have less technology than you'd imagine. Or the power cable goes out, and there's one power cable that's running up that uh, Kohala coast. So uh, it is still very country, and that's part of what people love about it, I think, who live there. There aren't any buildings over five or six stories tall at all yeah. on Big Island. It's yeah. totally different. But I, I think that people do have an expectation that for the tech part of things, that, that the neighbor islands, in fact, all of the state will keep up with the mainland. And, you know, that's really not happening. I remember a time when we had broadband that worked for everybody. And it was fast enough. It was as fast as any place in the country. And we had, you know, we were on the, um, yeah. you know, on the, on the, 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 the undersea cables, uh, mm -hmm. the crossings, all, all, you know, around the Pacific. But, you know, we do here in ThinkTech, we do Skype uh, everywhere. I mean, it could be anywhere in the world, and it has been. We also do Skype with the neighbor islands. And you know what? The Skype to Moscow is easier than a Skype to Kauai or the Big Island. Now, what is wrong with that picture? What does that tell us? Um, we don't have a very good connection. And it's not because it wasn't a good connection in the first place. It's that people are using this more. I mean, people are on the Internet more. They're doing more entertainment, everything. 
and the pipe is only so big. Now, uh, Hawaiian Telecom says they're going to build a bigger pipe, they're going to put, you know, many millions in, but that hasn't happened yet. And this uh, is a little scary to me because, you know, yes, we, we want to keep up, we want the neighbor islands to keep up, but in fact, we're not. We're, well, we're falling behind in a couple areas, actually. So, information is the most important area to keep up in because it fuels everything else, it feeds everything else. But I, this last week, was on a family reunion with um, my wife and kids, and uh, we were off in Boston and San Francisco. And I'll tell you, the airports there, I, you know, I love our airports in some ways, but the airports in those places were profoundly better uh, situated and kept up. The, uh, and that gave me pause. The same thing can be said of our public hospitals. We haven't been able to keep up with some of the investment that's necessary. And I was visiting some of the Harvard hospitals when I was over in Boston. And they are very, they're very different worlds than what we're able to keep up in our public hospital system. So that theme uh, resonates with me. I think that Hawaii has to keep up. It can't rely on um, just the kitschy, wonderful perspective that people have on it, the opinion that people have about Hawaii. We're going to have to do some essentials. Otherwise, we'll eventually lose, people will lose interest, and that would be terrible. Well, the first, the first people who lose interest would be the tourists or maybe the business guys, and the second would be our kids, yeah. and then the third would be our people. Yes. Uh, when they say, I, I can't tolerate this. I mean, I worry about the neighbor islands. I mean, yeah. you've covered it many times about health care in the neighbor islands yeah. and the physician shortage, but also, you know, the affair on Maui it was such a great idea to, um, you know, uh, to privatize the hospital there, mm -hmm. but it's stuck in court now. What is that? How come that happened? I mean, it's so obvious what we need to do. Everyone knows what we need to do. Why are we screwing around in court? I think it's because right now, uh, the unions are contesting whether or not it's going to do harm to, to their workers. And I think that the courts probably will sort this out pretty soon. This is a trial. Uh, it's not perfect. I, you know, my heart goes out to the workers, but at the same time, we put a package of resources together to try to you know, dull the negative effects. Uh, but even my friends who work in the hospitals, who are, of course, uh, good, solid public workers there, they realize that if we don't figure out a new model, those hospitals won't even be there. They will crumble into dust and there won't be a place for people to work. And then we'll really be... Or to get care. Yeah, right. Then we'll really be, you know, up the creek. Yeah. So I think um, we'd lose those jobs, we'd lose that capacity to take care of people. So the Maui experiment has to occur. Uh, but we have seen some examples of ourselves putting our, our, our heads in the sand. We saw that with Super Ferry, which I, I'll be quite candid, I supported very strongly. Um, because it's something new. It's innovative in its own way. It changes it gives people some sense of a change in approach to our state. We have to work out the differences culturally on the 30 meter telescope, but once we do, these are, these are additions to the state of Hawaii that don't have to disenfranchise anyone, but bring in the next generation, the next century, the next millennium, so that Hawaii is relevant, because it could be the most extraordinary place, but not if people think the hospitals won't survive, that you can't bring major innovators or big thinkers like the telescope folks or the, or, or any of the new transportation. And you can't people. have a super ferry either. I mean, so th those things have to give, but that probably speaks to who has the, um, who has the wherewithal to take a bold leadership position. We haven't had a lot of that over the years. Uh, it was interesting because uh, I was thinking about um, Governor Abercrombie recently, and uh, I, I'm very fond of of Neil. Uh, yeah, he he probably, you know, rubbed a few too many people the wrong way because he was really a go-getter. But sometimes you have to sock it to people to to get any change. Um, I also am very fond of of Governor Ige, but it remains to be seen whether we're going to take up the big issues. Yeah, I mean, we better do that. I mean, there's uh, gee, I mean, you just mentioned a few, and I think. When things get radioactive, yeah. and I include in that uh, the undersea cable for, for electric, yep. uh, the super, super ferry for right. transportation, and the TMT for science, yeah. all those things are somehow they got radioactive. And I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure that it's a local thing or maybe it's a human thing, 
Um, but when things get radioactive, they got a half-life that's way too long for you and me, uh -huh. and they don't get solved right away. Right. I don't see anything on the horizon, maybe you do, I don't see anything on the horizon that is going to solve any of those three problems. I don't know. I, I would say uh, the, let's take the, um, the TMT, okay, the 30-meter telescope. I don't know who bungled it from the get-go as far as how it should have been presented to the people of Hawaii, but th this is a little controversial. I'm happy to say it, though. The 30-meter telescope should have been approached like we approached the Hokulea, which has been an extraordinary uh, adventure and an adventure in science and in progress, representing the old ways and the new from Hawaii to the world. Those guys are in New York right now at the UN, God bless them, incredible credit to what their courage is and their just how great they are that approach exporting something uniquely wonderfully hawaiian could have been done and should have been done regarding the, the telescope because then you would be respecting those who are culturally uh focused on the mountain but also giving to mm -hmm. all the people i think if people had looked at it that way from the beginning we would have um agreement that it's a good thing for the state of hawaii uh, maybe a little less so about things like cables, although I like undersea cables, and I'll tell you why. I think Big Island and Maui can be energy producers for Oahu, and then they have an extra economic generator, which creates all kinds of opportunities. So those kind of ideas, if we want to be more than a tourist state that lingers, we're going to have to do these things. Vulnerable to events beyond our control. Well, that's right. I mean, if there's another 9-11, if there's another... Uh, major concern about travel, we're finished. Yeah. So, uh, and being finished means a lot of things. It means poverty, it means not being able to fund schools, it means not being able to uh, attract physicians. I mean, it means many, many things. So, being finished is not just uh, things are a little tougher. We're not finished here, though. Yes. Um, we're going to take a break, however. <laughs> Good. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's Josh Green, uh, Senator Josh Green of the Hawaii State Senate. He's from District 3 on the Big Island. Uh, we're talking about health in Hawaii in the larger sense. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros, y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Aloha. My name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Aloha. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech live streaming network series, weeklies on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Bingo, we're back. I told you we're coming back. Like MacArthur, I told you, and we came back. Watch that. Okay, Josh Green, Senator Josh Green, District 3 in the Big Island. Love to talk to him. This is a great discussion, as always. So, you know, we, we have a problem in terms of all this fragmentation, and I was going to add one of the elements of fragmentation, the fragmentation of the counties, of the islands. I call it insular drift. Yes. And I'm, I'm still on that. I've been writing about it, thinking about it for a long time, because I feel the islands don't talk to each other as much. You know, my, my youth, in my 20s, everybody went to the neighbor islands all the time. They, they carried their straw mat and their zoris and their igloo, uh -huh. <laughs> and they spent the weekends romantically on the neighbor island. It's too expensive to do that now. Right. And the families that used to, you know, move between the islands and gather in the home, the home place of the family, they don't do it. It's too expensive, and it just doesn't work that way anymore. So the result is the islands have their own communities that are more in silos than they were before. This is not a good thing for a state of islands, you know. I agree. Uh, that was, I, I don't know why we're talking so much about Super Ferry today, but that was another reason to do it to give people that flexibility. I, I just came back from a trip into, from the islands in the uh, Northeast where we were on the ferry every other day and it was just great. But it does give you the capacity to get around. I mean, I've got two kids, when my wife and, and my two children and I fly, it's $800 round trip at least, which is just, you know, we That's do- That's a lot of bread. Yeah, it is. And I'm working hard to try to pay the bills, but I'd rather be saving for their college and spend $800 just to get over to 
to Kona. So, mm-hmm. with them, so or back and forth to Honolulu. So it's um, a challenge. It, in the modern day of communication, we should be able to communicate at all times in every way. Uh, but you're right. Big Island has very, very different personality. Um, and I spent last weekend on Maui doing some work. Also, incredibly different personality. So, it's um, it is what it is. You get different kind of mayors. You get different kind of councils. Tell you, Big Island Council is also a very different council than that in Honolulu. Why? why? I mean, Big Island is different, and uh, you know, I think the TMT, um, you know, controversy could not have happened on another island. Probably not. Only on the Big Island. Yeah. Right. The Big Island um, has a history and spirit of uh, kind of nonviolent uh, objection to issues, and I do respect that. Uh, but the Big Island has seen long-standing protests over geothermal, of course the building on the mountain, um, whether or not the super ferry would come. So uh, the Big Island does um, kind of have a, a very local feel, and people covet that um, internally. So it's, in some ways it's positive. There's a lot of very good families and, and a lot of uh, at-home feeling. There really is not much to worry about violence or crime. Occasionally we have a spike here or there. So it's special. But we still need to be connected. We got to, we got to be connected because if we if we hang together, we're better off. We right. can do, we can solve problems, yeah. at least theoretically. But you know, it comes down to, um, it, it comes down to leadership, you know, business leadership, academic leadership, and government leadership. And you know, it strikes me that over the years, I, I don't think we've had the kind of leadership we have. We aspire to leadership. We yeah. wait for Gordo. Yeah. We wait for. A leader to come and bring us all together, all the islands together, bring us together in the solution of these problems. You know, homelessness, yeah. um, med- med- medical care, yeah. um, science, all that, all these things we've been talking about. Um, but it hasn't happened, and I think it sort of falls back on this kind of hoping for a consensus that won't come. <laughs> Plus, you have an influx of different people here, so that creates some challenges. Some, uh, I guess, maybe there's a lack of trust sometimes. I think that we got spoiled under Senator Inouye's leadership, mm. and the gentle leadership of Senator Carker was very, very steady, but the, the fatherly leadership for all of Hawaii of Senator Inouye, everyone leaned on that so heavily, whether, I mean, I've been in the legislature 12 years now, which is surprising, and I watched it from the beginning, and everyone always, if the question was, how are we going to fund this, how are we going to do this, the answer always was Senator Inouye. And he did. He was incredibly helpful for us. Um, we now have, from my perspective, a wonderful young senator and Senator Schatz. Maisie's got you know heart of gold, and you know, they're terrific people. But it has changed a little bit, and so there does appear to be we're, we're taking a pause. I don't think people know yet who's going to emerge with that voice of Hawaii because he was a booming voice of Hawaii for like 40, 50 years, um, and it will emerge in time. Uh, it's not something you can predict, though. You know, the thing about being in the delegation in general yeah. is that um, your, the weight of your time and effort, the weight of your career, essentially, your, your daily process is in Washington. Yeah. You have to attend to business in Washington. And it's actually hard. We, we're the furthest ones, maybe Alaska, I don't know. Yeah, we we're, are. We're a long way. Yeah. Um, and so it's hard to spend time in both places. It's hard to maintain the connections. The thing about Dan in Oway is that he did do that. Yeah. He had a great presence here. Um, he was doing things here all the time. At the same time, he was active in Washington, both places. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And he, I, he transcended uh, the body politic. He really did, which is super rare. Uh, you, no one can aspire to be him. I mean, to be a war hero and to be a legacy and legendary um, leader, it, it's, you just don't see that. But it takes time to give, to give credit to any of our current delegation. They may grow into that. It, it, you just don't know. Uh, but these days, you're right. The, the local leadership, the face of leadership, will probably have to be, whether it's a governor or lieutenant governor or whomever, might have to be here or mayor um, because... I don't see much happening just yet, and it seems like we're just kind of dealing with the simmering crises of the time, and we're playing small ball. Uh, we're going to have to play big ball if, if you want to get that kind of satisfaction. Yeah. The other thing is, is business, if I can go to business for a minute. Yeah. You know, um, they used to have uh, Pfeiffer comes to mind, mm-hmm. the, the leader of A&B. Uh, 
And you know, everybody knew him. He knew everybody. He was more than he was more than a CEO yeah. of A and B. He was a, a CEO that um, you know that, that was magnetic, and he had a lot of effect, a lot of influence. And in business, he was a leader. And I think he took affirmative steps outside his company in the society and uh, the business society in general. And I think we need some of that, but we don't have the big companies like that. That's the only, really, A and B, the only really big board company I can think of. Right. Uh, of Hawaiian Electric, too, but that's not the same thing. It's a little different, and that was, I think, part of the reticence of seeing, and I don't know how this will play out ultimately, but the reticence of seeing Next Era or someone from very far away uh, becoming a player here. Uh, like, for instance, I give a lot of kudos to a guy like Art Ushijima, who I think is one of our, he's a quiet uh, general, but a general nonetheless. And Art does a lot of important things institutionally and behind the scenes that resonate. Uh, and we have a few of those. Um, I, they're interesting CEOs. They're very good people. Mike Gold's another one that comes to mind. I think he's a very visionary CEO. HMSA. At HMSA. But Mike doesn't like the spotlight per se. So you don't really see that kind of effect that you're saying that the A and B CEO had. And also, right now, there's a generational switch. I've noticed that a lot of the CEOs are turning over, and you're seeing people in 40-somethings like myself come into positions where they are growing into them, and they're, they have to feel it, you know? And a lot of times, it takes a few years for them to feel it. And some of those people will spark, and then there'll be fire, and then there'll be excitement and ideas. Uh, but to take people seriously who are newly CEOs or new to leadership role, eh, you know, it doesn't happen a lot of the time. No, and we've been waiting. You know, it's like it's waiting for Godot again, yeah. waiting for the generation to bubble up because the older CEOs, who whether they stay in place, a lot of them do, uh -huh. um, they're like past their prime, and and they're not, and their kids have gone to the mainland. They're they don't they're, their heart's not here anymore. Yeah. They talk about vision. They don't see vision because this isn't really their place. Their family weight has gone elsewhere, uh -huh. um, and so we need this new generation, and we wait for it like we wait for the millennials. We yeah. wait for them to vote. Yeah. We wait for them to get involved in politics. We wait for them to take positions on, on important public issues. Yeah. But, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. We're in between. We are. We're in an in, in between era. And so one thing that would be disconcerting is if any of our um, forest fires ignite. Like, let me give you a very good example. Homelessness is the one right now. It's the, it's the problem of this particular part of the decade which seems to have ignited. And sometime in the next 18 months, if we don't contain this wildfire, it's going to be very bad. It already has been, um, first of all, the people are suffering that are homeless, a lot of them. They have to be helped. Number two, the New York Times picks this kind of thing up, and they say paradise or no. And <laughs> that's a bit... It's a legitimate question. It's a legitimate question, and the answer in some cases is no. If you're talking about moving a community of homeless individuals from one part of Honolulu to another, that is not a game that we should be playing. So we do need major change, major, major leadership on this issue. Because if it continues to spiral out of control, it will not only affect the value of, of people's lives here and the quality of life, but it will give a different perception about Hawaii. And Hawaii's perception to the rest it's of the planet everything. is everything. Right. So I think that's the problem of our time. And I think a lot of our political leaders will be judged on how we handle that and who steps up, if I may. Um, but there's a lot of big issues out there. That just is the one that's so visible. Yeah, it is. It, but it's more than just one. It's a barometer for yeah. others. Right. I mean, it's telling us about the disparity. It, it is so shocking, you yeah. know, in, its, in, its, uh, in the way it works. And, I mean, the, the old thing about, so we're having all these buildings coming up in Kaka'ako, and they look down on the tent city. What's wrong with this picture? This is not the Hawaii that we want. I think this started with this particular the energy in the air on this issue started when, it's just my opinion, when the, remember the one percenter movement a few years back, not too many years back, when all of a sudden it seemed like there were clusters of extra people huddling in parks, very frustrated, obviously um, economically challenged as people. And um, there was some activism in the air, but there was also that desperation in the air. That desperation seems to have settled in different parts of the country. And when I see something like homelessness and the kind of economic disparity, I hearken back to those images. Um, and if you bear with me for half a second, I think that those, that, that challenge and, and energy that is sitting here in the state of Hawaii 
permeates other questions negatively. For instance, the one percenter movement got translated, I think, to major protests against, say, the 30 meter telescope and also against any discussion about um, solutions on the super ferry and other things like that. Not because they weren't okay ideas to look at culturally, like I said about the Hokulia approach, which I think would have been good for all. But when you start having one after another because people are so frustrated and so disenchanted with leadership and disenchanted with the direction of a state, um, it's very difficult to just move. And that, I think, is one of our biggest challenges. Someone's going to have to kind of bring the hammer down and say, we all are included, but we're cracking this, uh, this uh, sedentary mentality for change. We have to look at the fundamentals. And the, and the fundamentals are disparity, it's jobs, it's income, right. uh, it's, it's fairness in dealing with people, it's fairness in dealing with the homeless, it's fairness in dealing with uh, you know, the Hawaiian culture issues. Yeah. And as uh, Oz Stender at a program we did a, a couple of months ago involving uh, alternatives to sovereignty, yes. he said, we, unless we, until we solve the sovereignty disaffection, yes. we're, we can't move forward. We have to solve it. We'll never solve the other problems without solving that one as a fundamental. Interesting. And so is the income disparity and other fundamentals. Yeah. So, you know, leadership has got to get down on these things, work these things out. We haven't addressed them. We haven't addressed the economics, really. Well, it's all, there are, many of these issues are tied together because when you say disparities, there's huge economic disparities. The Hawaiian people suffer the greatest health disparities. They have one or two standard deviations, worse health outcomes and also they have a massive need for finance and support through the Medicaid program, which is over $2 billion. One out of every $6 that we spend as a state goes to the Medicaid program just to kind of keep ourselves alive and afloat because of those disparities. So that inequality and that sovereignty question is resonating both economically and culturally. And so that is a very good point that I hope that he can continue to take up because it's very true. Yeah. Okay, final words. There's Vivian. That's your camera over there, Josh, Senator Josh Green. Uh, what do you say to the people to coalesce all of these points? I'd say uh, get excited about different systems and different change. Don't be shy about trying new things for Hawaii. I think that the resiliency of our culture and the extraordinary nature of the people, the Hawaiian people, uh, the Japanese people that have been here, the Caucasians, Hallies, Filipinos that have all come, uh, that will be preserved, that will prevail. So just because we take on some new ad adventures, don't worry that Hawaii is going to go away or change. Be excited that it will be something that will become available to our children, to their children, and really give us all opportunities to make sure people come home to Hawaii. That's great advice. That's really important. You've been thinking about this a lot, haven't you? Yeah, I, I sit in hearing after hearing, wondering what can we really do to make something uh, better for Hawaii. And I would love to see us take up these gigantic challenges on every issue, whether it's health or human services, or transportation or culture. I mean, these are the things that we can take up. And we're really, I don't think we're going to do so much harm that we're going to crack Hawaii. I don't think that's possible. Yeah. So be excited about the adventure of change. What a great adventure. It's a good time, uh, even though it may not seem to be. <laughs> Senator Josh Green, um, District 3 on the Big Island. Uh, health in Hawaii, the health of Hawaii, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's uh, what I call this, uh, Green and Fidel let their hair down, such as it is. Thank you so much, Senator. <laughs> Thank you.